Are you making him all better? Good job. My daughter, Brooke, when she was an infant, was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, which means her heart is enlarged three times the size of, that it should have been. And there were really no other options besides a heart transplant. Okay. You want to go take a break? She's like, uh, no. We're so thankful for this gift of a new heart, but it's always a delicate balance. It's kind of, we've been through the ringer and come to the other side where she can live a normal life. Look at you now, young lady. Oh my gosh, how are you? Yeah. Are you here to pick up the balance? Yeah. She's at 10 years old, Brooke Balk has already survived several health battles. And while most children are protected from illnesses like measles and whooping cough because they're vaccinated, Brooke is always at risk. She takes immunosuppressant medications and her body could not fight a vaccination. Can you see Catalina? Catalina, is it way out there? See that it's like kind of hazy right there? Yeah. See if you can focus in on that. The only thing keeping her safe from diseases like measles is herd immunity. That means she has to be surrounded by a community where about 95% of the population has been vaccinated. In public school, we worry that there could be somebody who brings in a disease that's previously eradicated. Actually, somebody came into Brooks' doctor's office with the measles. And so when that happened, Brooke and all other children like her needed to stay home from school. They couldn't go to school for two months, which meant I needed to stay home with her. I'm a fifth grade teacher, which means I have to have a substitute in my class, and I'm paying for that substitute um, to keep my daughter home and safe because anywhere she goes in the community is a potential lethal disease. Many parents think of measles as just a common nuisance, which makes their children feel miserable and keeps them out of school for a while. But physicians today know that measles is more than a nuisance. Before the measles vaccine, the illness killed four to 500 people every year in the United States and caused brain damage to others. But the real story of a vaccine is told in the fears and smiles of a little girl who today is given greater protection than ever before against the infectious diseases of childhood. Measles is a highly contagious disease. People with the illness can infect others for up to eight days, and it lives in the air for up to two hours. The disease was declared eliminated in the U.S. in the year 2000. But 14 years later, the outbreaks returned. The measles outbreak that has been traced to Disneyland continues to grow. Back in December 2014, someone brought measles to Disneyland and it started spreading uh, in Orange County, across the state, across the country, I mean, through 2015. And at that time, we recognized that uh, we've had years and years of rising uh, exemption rates uh, among students and that we were not safe against diseases we thought we had conquered. Vaccines are required for students to begin school in all 50 states. But at the time of the Disneyland measles outbreak, California allowed for religious and philosophical exemptions. And that's ultimately why we originally passed the law saying that you should get vaccinated before you enter school. And that's why we need to take further steps to be sure we can protect the public health. So I, uh, working with uh, my colleagues, Senator Allen, authored a bill to eliminate the non-medical exemptions because we, people have traced those non-medical exemption rates to places where the outbreak would spread more rapidly. California State Senate Bill 277 passed by a wide margin and was enacted in 2016. It was the biggest sigh of relief for us because public schools should be a place where kids are safe. and. Now I felt like they were. After the law went into effect, vaccination rates in California increased by 3.5 percent, according to a study by healthcare economists at George Washington University. But some of the counties that previously had high non-medical exemption rates for vaccines began to see a striking increase in medical exemptions. I've seen medical exemptions that 
look very inappropriate. Uh, we know there are physicians who are advertising medical exemptions. Uh, the California Department of Public Health has uh, done an assessment. Again, they don't have the total information, but they are estimating probably 40% of all permanent medical exemptions are probably inappropriate. Um, and then if you look at the background of a lot of these physicians, they, they don't have a background, for example, in pediatrics. They don't have a background, for example, in um, infectious diseases. This is really a pain, honey. I would never do this if it wasn't for dance. There's a doctor 20 minutes away from us who is writing fake exemptions. It's not hidden. It's not um, something whispered about. It's talked about openly. I hear people talking about it at the baseball park who to go to to get an exemption and how much they charge for those exemptions. And those are people who go to my school that are having those conversations. And so I worry. I look at my daughter in a music class or in an assembly and she's just sitting among random kids and I don't know if any of them could potentially be vac unvaccinated and what that could mean to her and her health. I could get majorly sick and have to go to the hospital. I don't think it's worth faking. Like, I think you could just get, like, shots because, like, I've been to the hospital enough times that I shouldn't be having to go again. Dancers. Now, some parents and lawmakers are trying to put a stop to fake medical exemptions from the halls of the state capitol in Sacramento. But a vocal group of parents stand firmly on the other side of the debate. Why are we here? Why are we children? What do we stand for? Freedom! Well, I have a child who um, has never been vaccinated because of family history, and he had eczema when he was born. When my child is sick who hasn't been vaccinated, I keep him out of school. Sure, there's that chance, um, but children go to school, children that are that severely sick with immunocompromised, I mean, they're going to school with kids that might have a cold or the flu, and so, you know, sure, I want to protect those children too, but um, my child's not sick and he's not passing it to other people. I think these parents who are seeking these medical exemptions are excellent parents. I also think that they're misinformed and I think they're wrong. And I think what they're doing is they're falling prey to conspiracy theories, they're falling prey to misinformation spread by Russian bots, and they're not following the scientific evidence, they're not following conventional medical advice. That's the problem. We're zeroing in on it, guys. <laughs> We're gonna go over as a group and do our Me Too's, um, and then- Vaccinate California, led by Leah Russin, sponsored the 2015 bill to eliminate non-medical exemptions. Now she's organizing supporters to stand behind new legislation. Like, because we may cut one video that's all doctors, and then we'll cut another video that's all moms, right? So last one, year, two, when the data three. came out showing that the kindergarten medical exemption rate had jumped again, it had tripled, Members of Vaccinate California and other advocacy groups and coalition members started talking and talking with Dr. Pan about whether we should do anything and whether we could do anything. Measles causes death. We do not need to see that in our country and our state. And as we were watching, measles started spreading. Just this year alone, we've had four outbreaks of measles in California. So we had to start working on a new piece of legislation which would impose some oversight over these doctors that are writing these fake medical exemptions. In other words, everybody gets the same amount of time. Okay. Jenny Balk decided to become politically active for the first time ever this year because she was so concerned about this issue. She was asked to tell Brooke's story at a hearing on the bill, so she flew in from Orange County to be there. There are assembly people who have stated their opposition to the bill and have retweeted anti-vaccine talking points. So I would not be shocked if one of them would ask something like, really, you wouldn't feel safe having any of these other children in class with you? Just hold your guard and say, no, my doctor really said no. I really would not. Yeah. Yeah, I really would not. What we're doing with SB 276 is providing the information to the public health authorities. But this protection is being undermined. So that they know 
how many exemptions are out there, who has them, and for what reason, and who's writing them. So this is really about oversight. And I understand that people who choose not to vaccinate their children believe that they are doing what is right for their children. But what they feel is right for their kids puts my child in mortal jeopardy every day. We have had whooping cough in my neighborhood two weeks ago. My daughter does competitive dance. It was a com another dance studio in our neighborhood. It is prevalent. It is everywhere in our community. We all went back up to Sacramento and there were lines and lines of people opposing the bill and lines and lines of people supporting the bill. I'm a grandmother of four and a mother of three with a vaccine injured grandson and I strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. I will never consent. Thank you. Um, I'm from Orange County and I'm begging you to please not pass this bill I oppose. Can I tell you that I oppose the bill? You're going to cause a revolution if this passes. One opponent of the bill is Dr. Ron Kennedy, an anti-aging psychiatrist in Santa Rosa. The state medical board is investigating whether Kennedy improperly issued blanket medical exemptions. The Washington Post reached out to Kennedy for comment on the investigation. He declined. I am a vaccine-injured physician. And I oppose this bill. The vast majority of the doctors were on our side, but there were a few who opposed the bill as well. It's basically stop and frisk. You are presumed guilty. In my case, there's a lot of misinformation about why I am on probation. So I would point out that actually the one person the medical board has uh, actually put on probation for inappropriate medical exemption is Dr. Sears himself, who's here. The <laughs> here, uh, he's also <laughs> he used to have a list of vaccine-friendly like, physicians on his website. He said it's taken Leah Russin is hoping that if this legislation passes, it can be used as a blueprint for other states. These people um, who are sick in New York, they're not just staying in New York. They're taking the subway, that's fine. They're traveling to Pennsylvania. There's, we can trace the disease as it travels across the country. Madam Secretary, we have a motion by Dr. Arambula, a second by Mr. Bonta. The motion is due pass as amended to appropriations. And with that, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Would I? Would I, Mays? So these, these outbreaks don't just stay put, and um, the only way to stop them is to inoculate the community, and um, that only happens when we have laws like this. So I hope that other states do follow our lead. Dr. Pan, your bill has nine votes, it's out of the committee. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. 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 We did it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. SB 276 has to clear several more hurdles before it makes its way to Governor Gavin Newsom's desk. Newsom has indicated that if the bill gets to him, he will sign it into law. <laughs> Say, I'm so cute. I'm so cute. <laughs> okay, I'll see you later. All done video. Say bye-bye video. Bye-bye, Beard.